Hello, I'm Jay Taylor with Warren Berkeley, and we welcome you to this episode of All About Books. Warren and I enjoy reading, we enjoy talking about reading, and not only books about the Bible, but we're really big on daily Bible reading. And these episodes, we bring on an author uh, to talk about books, uh, books that they have written. And so, Warren, who do we have with us today? We have David King. I've known and respected David and his family for a little over 45 years. David and I spent some very good time together in Kansas back in the 70s and 80s. And uh, David has served in many capacities through the years, preacher, elder, very devoted family man, now a published author with very good material. And that material is based on, of course, the highest source. David, thanks for joining us in this episode of All About Books. Warren, it's an honor to be here today and to talk to you and Jay uh, about these books. Uh, this is a, a project that I never really anticipated uh, in years past, but once I retired a couple of years ago, uh, this just kind of jumped out at me as something that I could do and that would be profitable for other people. Good. We always begin by asking authors where they started in their early reading habits. So tell us something about your early reading habits. Did you love to read as a child or was it something you had to do? Tell us about your experience with books. Yes, I from the earliest possible age I can remember, I loved to read. Uh, my parents always had books around the house and uh, I read everything I could get my hands on. They, they also had uh, books on history, and I developed very early a love of uh, reading history books, and that stayed with me throughout the years. I have very fond memories as a little boy of my mom taking uh, my siblings and I to the little one-room city library in Baytown, Texas to check out books, and usually they were books on history. And... Uh, and from that point on, I've, I've just always had a fascination with books, being able to open up pages and just read and, and learn from that process. Are you at your uh, at the church building or at your home right now? I'm in my home office. OK, so you look right behind David and you can see all the books that he's got there. And uh, I'm sure he's read all of them. Yeah, right. <laughs> and this is just a fraction. I've got my walls in this office are just lined with bookshelves full of books. Yeah. Jay? Well, the project that we really are interested in, the Wings Like Eagles. So tell us, how did this project get started? Uh, what's included in this project? Uh, tell us about that. Yeah, um, as we mentioned earlier, uh, these books are a compilation of bulletin articles that I have written throughout the years. Some of these stretch all the way back into the late 1970s. Um, and all through these years, with sporadic gaps here and there, I was publishing a weekly uh, bulletin article for the, the uh, church bulletin. And around the year 2000, uh, I settled on a more standard format, and the title Wings uh, became the title of the, the bulletin that I published every week. And, uh, and that continued right up until around, well, at the beginning of COVID in, in March of 2020. At that point, like so many churches, we were shut down for a few weeks, and the elders asked me, uh, could I st start writing these uh, articles on a daily basis and send it out to the members in an email? And we started doing that, and the people loved it so much that even after things opened back up, uh, I just continued sending out these daily emails. So some of the shorter articles in these books are, were actually the more recent email articles that I was sending out. But through it all, from the beginning, uh, my 
mode of operation was to base each article on a scripture text. My, my, my aim was always to, to point people back to the scriptures, back to the Bible, back to the book. And sometimes the article was an exposition of a text. Sometimes the opening text was not much more than a springboard to discuss some uh, current event or a cultural issue that uh, brethren had to deal with. But in every, in every respect, what I was trying to do in these articles was to point people to the Bible as a source of answers for the big questions of life. That's good. There are six volumes that have been published. Uh, tell us about the content, uh, Genesis through Revelation. What are they about? Yeah. Uh, when you just look at the book sitting on the shelf, it looks like a highly organized body of work, but it was not designed that way. I never, never had any kind of dream or ambition of publishing books from these articles that I was writing. From week to week, the articles would just bounce all over the scriptures. One week, Genesis, the next week, the book of James. And you know, I was just giving people a, a wide variety of articles from week to week, from throughout the Bible, front to back. And it wasn't until I retired and I uh, was sitting here in my office one day and I looked at all of the the paper copies of these articles I had written through all these years. And the thought occurred to me, number one, if when I'm gone and my kids clean out my office, all that work that I put into writing these articles is just going to be tossed in the trash. And I thought, yeah, I think there's something of value here. And the fact that I had written these articles based on scripture text meant I could probably reorganize them from Genesis to Revelation and come up with something that would be publishable. And so I actually did that. I cleared out a big space here in my office floor and I started reorganizing all of these paper copies of, you know, 30 years worth of, of bulletin articles and arranged them, rearranged them, got them the proper order and started separating them apart. And I settled on these six stacks roughly equal stacks of bulletin articles from Genesis to Revelation. And the six books are the end result. Of course, I had a lot of uh, review, proofreading, uh, some editing, polishing along the way. Uh, occasionally, there would be uh, scripture text that I would have two th or three articles through the years on that. And so I'd have to make a decision. Do I pick one of these? Do I merge two or three of them? So there was a lot of that kind of tedious work that went into reducing all of this body of information into publishable work. Warren? David, is there a, uh, can you hear me? We can I hear can. You. Okay. My, uh, I think my video is frozen. Uh, is there a specific use of these books that you had in mind? Maybe you've already answered some of that. And what about the use of these books today in their published form? So classwork, uh, individual reading, reference, maybe parent-child, home Bible study. Talk about some of the uses of uh, these books. Well, all of the above, of course. Uh, actually, the what I consider to be the, the primary uh, value of these books is as devotional reading, private devotional reading. Uh, the articles are very simple they they take up one page and then the back page and that's it you can read the whole article in five minutes and then move on to the next one so it'd be i think great for you know bedside devotional reading and uh, people can can read one or two articles before they go to bed and, and get something of value uh, another uh, area where i think these books could be valuable is is in people doing exactly what I was doing, uh, publishing church bulletins. Um, in fact, each one of these volumes on the copyright page has a 
specific uh, permission given to publish these articles in church bulletins, of course, with proper attribution. And, and I'm, I'm happy for people to reuse this material uh, however, however they desire in, uh, in church bulletins. Um, but you mentioned uh, resource, uh, reference, pipe work. Um, I did take the time and trouble when, in each one of these volumes to create both a subject index and a scripture index. So I think somebody could actually use these uh, works as a, a research tool. And I think, I think they could be helpful there. I think so. And then uh, when you're working on a particular passage, uh, it's pretty easy to pull up the volume that contains that section of scripture. And, right. And I've done that. I, I confess I did use attribution, but just to, to freshen up my own thoughts about a passage, I, I've done that. So I think there's a wide variety of, of uses for, for these books. Jay, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're, uh, we're studying through the wisdom literature, and in one of our recent Bible studies, I, I had referenced uh, what you had written on Ecclesiastes 11, verses 9 and 10, uh, and there was a, 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 a very good point that you had made about our duty is to listen to God and and uh, to to do what he says, and so just lots of good uses uh, for these books. You also wrote, by better understanding God, I have come to better understand myself. That's uh, from uh, something you've written in the wisdom vol volume. Uh, what do you mean by that? Help us help us think about that. Yeah, I think that came out of the, the preface to that wisdom volume, volume two. And, and really what I was driving at there was the idea that um, the wisdom literature, of course, is... We, we tend to think of it in terms of, you know, here are principles for living life wisely, which is true. But a big part of living the wise life is to see the hand of God behind life. And to the extent that we can see God's presence in, in this relationship that we have with him, it's, it's, we're not just following rules. We're in a relationship with the creator of the heavens and the earth. To the extent that we can appreciate that relationship, see the person behind what we're reading here, the easier it is to see ourselves as we really are. And not just to see ourselves as we are, which is flawed human beings, but at the same time to see the potential that God sees in us. He created us for a purpose, to glorify Him. And the more that we, we dig into, especially the wisdom literature, but all of God's Word, but the more we come to appreciate him, who he is, what he means in our life, and it will um, it will strengthen, it will embolden us in our lives to, to live lives for him. That's good, David. Uh, we do something called a lightning round. We have about four very quick questions, and uh, usually at least one of them is designed to kind of break up the uh, the session in, in a sort mm -hmm. of a light-hearted way. Number one, authors and books that you like outside of Scripture. Well, there's so many. Where do I begin? Uh, but, but I would have to say there's probably two that have had the, the greatest influence in, in my work as a preacher and as a writer. Uh, I started preaching in the 70s, and uh, as you know yourself, Warren, having gone through that period of time, it, it was it was a rather tumultuous time. Um, there was a a lot of the journalism at that time, unfortunately, was not very helpful. But there was one man whose writings had a tremendous influence on me. And in fact, uh, one of the articles in Volume One is a tribute to that man uh, upon his passing, and that's Robert Turner. Um, Whereas a lot of other men were engaged in, in, in a lot of, uh, well, I won't say nitpicky, but, but just a lot of fractious behavior that was not helpful. Uh, Robert Turner rose above the fray. He was not dodging the issues. Uh, th there were important concepts that needed to be discussed, but his, his way of approaching truth 
and, and teaching in such a way that people could grasp the beauty of, of God's truth, God's word, and applied to these and apply, application to these issues, uh, just had a profound impact on me. Uh, in fact, I would say that that his uh, uh, plain talk uh, monthly bulletin that he sent it out had a great influence on kind of guiding me in the writing of my articles. I might suggest while I'm on Robert Turner, there's a great deal of controversy that's going on today on the subject of grace. You probably see some of the internet flame wars going on on that topic. Um, about 35 years ago, uh, Turner preached a series of sermons on the subject of grace. And those sermons were later published in a little booklet called Sermons on Grace. And this is one of the best, most even-handed subjects or treatments of the subject uh, that I think people could read. And if they're interested in that, I don't know if this is still in print or not, uh, but I would suggest that people get a hold of Turner's little book and it'd be a tremendous resource for navigating that subject. Another author that has been a great influence, and of course, in mentioning this man's name, I have to issue the usual caveats I do not endorse everything that this man teaches, and you'll know why as soon as I mention his name, and that is Tim Keller. Uh, he's a Presbyterian uh, preacher, but his book, The Reason for God, was one of the best treatments of apologetics since C.S. Lewis's uh, Mere Christianity. Uh, I've read several of his books. Uh, the Prodigal God is pretty good. There's another book of his that I read, and that is called Generous Justice, Generous Justice. And he makes a statement here. If I could take the time to just read a paragraph here, he's talking about the subject of justice and, and the role that uh, believers play in trying to bring justice into a very unjust world. Um he poses a question, should believers act as individuals out in the world or through their local church? In other words, how do Christians influence the world? And um, he says the church should help believers shape every area of their lives with the gospel. But that doesn't mean that the church as an institution is itself to do everything it equips its members to do. Now think about that. He goes on to say, he references Abraham Kuyper, who was a Dutch theologian from an earlier century. Kuyper concluded that the institutional church's mission is to evangelize and nurture believers in Christian community. As it does this work, it produces people who engage in art, science, education, journalism, filmmaking, business in distinctive ways as believers in Christ. The church, in this view, produces individuals who change society, but the local congregation should not itself engage in these enterprises. That is what we call limited benevolence, limited congregational benevolence. It's a Presbyterian preacher who said that. When I first read that, I just fell out of my chair. And, and some of my own brethren don't get that principle. Yeah. Anyway, That's I really appreciated that. That's good. Uh, time left, about six minutes, so I'm going to jump around in our notes here. Uh, quickly, urgently needed subjects from the pulpit in our time. I would say the big thing that we need to address today is the reasonableness of faith in an alien, hostile culture. Um, our brethren are very good at preaching the Bible to our people. We are terrible at helping our people understand the culture in which they live, and particularly our young people. Our young people are growing up in a world that is so hostile to faith, and we, I fear, do not fully understand or grasp the significance of what our young people are facing. So I think one of the things that, that we need to focus on is to, is to better understand the culture in which we live. I'm currently reading a book by Jonathan Haidt called The Anxious Generation, and its subtitle is How the Great Rewiring of Childhood is Causing an Epidemic of Mental Illness. He's explaining why 
Gen Z is such a mess today. And preachers and elders, parents need to understand what's going on and how we can address that. The scriptures are a fantastic resource for helping address that, but we need to translate the scriptures into something that our young people can understand and grasp. Thank you. Uh, we got about four minutes. Jay, talk to David about daily Bible reading for a couple of minutes. Yeah, one of the things that we like to highlight, of course, we love to read books, but the one book that we're always trying to drive people to read is, is of course, the Bible. And so talk about daily Bible reading. Uh, what do you do for daily Bible reading? What do you recommend for other people to do? I'll be honest with you. I've never been a big fan of uh, uh, personal Bible reading plans, read through the Bible in a year. The times that I've tried to do that, I would end up getting bogged down in trying to finish the schedule, meet the schedule, instead of really absorbing what I was reading. So my preference is to burrow in to a book, just read chunks of text and take the time to analyze it, to think about it, to process it. Uh, in the process, I will take a lot of notes jotting down ideas for more articles or sermons or class material or whatever. And um, another thing that has helped in my Bible reading is the fact for the past 35 years or so, the congregation here has uh, on Sunday mornings uh, used a program of studying the entire Bible for, in four years, two years in the Old Testament, two years in the New Testament. And so everybody is working through the Bible in those four years. And then in classes, we're studying it, we're discussing it, we're, we're turning it inside and out, trying to apply it. And, and that has been, for me, a, a very practical and useful means of staying abreast of the entire scope of the Bible and learning it. That sounds good. We've got about two minutes. We've got to wrap it up and Zoom is going to cut us off. So ordering information, when uh, this video is posted, we will put ordering information underneath the post on Facebook <clears throat> and you can go to Spirit Building and uh, you can find David's. We hope David has some future writing plans but a legacy of good material is already in print to help us study through God's Word. Jay and I are talking about reviving these video podcasts, and so watch our post on social media. Check back on YouTube, and remember, it's not about the servants. It's about the Master. A final word, Jay. Give you a minute. Hey, we appreciate uh, having you, David. We we look forward to this, and we appreciate all the good work. Uh, again, everything will be posted on our social media, and uh, stay, stay tuned for future episodes. Thank you.